John Connolly, welcome to the Bestseller Experiment. It's great to see you today. How are you feeling? I'm very well. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Always a pleasure. Our absolute pleasure. Our absolute pleasure. Now, we're here to celebrate well, the, the 10th anniversary of the Book of Lost Things, which I've got a copy of this in my hands now, and it is truly a thing of beauty. It's, it's a very difficult thing to get gold foil on books these days. As somebody <laughs> yeah, who works in yeah. publishing, yeah. they must really, really love you My to put the gold foil on there. cleaning chimneys for a very long time. <laughs> Tim Healy Hutchinson's chimneys are going to be the cleanest <laughs> mansion chimneys around. Now, it's very unusual for a book to get a 10th anniversary edition. What is it about this book, above all others, that, that has endured? Why do you think people are still reading it now? Um, I, that's a very good question. I think... You know, it was a book that when it came out was got a lot of support from librarians and booksellers um, and wasn't maybe what I was expected to write because I was known as a, a primarily known as a mystery writer. And I think very early on you get put in a little box and the longer you stay in that box, the harder it is to, to break out and do something different. So what, very early on, I knew that I wanted to do other things. But when this book came out, I remember fantasy, although I don't think it's a fantasy novel, um, the worst reviews it got were from fantasy writers who I think felt that this was somebody uh, moving off his patch into theirs. They were quite protective of their garden. Uh, they didn't want no crime writer coming in and standing on the rose bushes. Um, and it's kind of, it, it's a book that, that has found a readership by word of mouth. It gets recommended by readers to other readers, which is quite a lovely thing because it's a book about books and and how books are not fixed objects that we bring our life experiences to bear on whatever we read. And no two readers read a book in quite the same way. And also it's about how, uh, I guess, books are, uh, they're kind of, they're kind of an infection. You know, to to read a book that you love um, changes you. You know, we have been altered by books and you're never quite the same person again. And so there needs to be a kind of, for a reader, you need to be unselfish and open to get the real joy out of fiction, to, to endure. And it's a book about grief and loss and fairy tales, particularly fairy tales. And there's something very atavistic and elemental about fairy tales. They, even as adults, they latch into something because they deal with these, these they deal with things that we're all going to go through, grief and loss and um, the struggle from the, 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 the world of childhood into the adult world. And that's a struggle that for adults keeps on going. You know, when you're a kid, you think that you've got to get a book of rules at 18, which explains everything. Okay. Uh, and then yeah. it's OK. And, you know, and actually what happens that. is that you keep struggling as an adult. <laughs> you keep encountering new problems and difficulties. It's very interesting. When I was younger, I remember I would read Stephen King. He was the first kind of author that I read book after book after book by as a, as a teenager. Um, as a young I'm preteen as well because that's how old he is um, and um, and then I remember kind of falling out of love with him when I entered my 20s I, I read I think it it is the, the moment when I fall out of love with Stephen King and it's not him it's me right. um, and then later I, I came back to him and the themes that he was dealing with in his books of, of illness, uh, mortality and pain, adult pain were very different from the themes that he was dealing with in his in his earlier fiction which were very often about teenagers and teenage yeah. life um, and so my, it's interesting to take that kind of that kind of journey with a writer uh, and to realise that, I, you know, that, 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 that you can reconnect with a writer down the line I think and so I suppose the Book of Lost Things deals with some of those themes that, that are universal uh, you know, the, the awful thing about, about, well, good and bad thing about life, I suppose, is that, um, you know, we will all go through the same things. We will, if we're lucky, we will fall in love. We will fall out of love. We will all experience mortality and grief. We will all, in the in the inevitable cycle of things, we will probably lose parents. And yet nobody is ever going to fall in love quite the way that you fall in love. And nobody is ever going to experience loss or, you know, the joy of, of having a child. Uh, being a parent the way that you will, because nobody like you has ever existed before. And I always think that the purpose of fiction, or one of the purposes of fiction, is to find the universal and the specific, to take those things that, that are actually individually felt and yet make them understandable. Because And to have that moment of contact, I think, between a writer and a reader, because people don't want sympathy. Sympathy is a very easy Thing, emotion, or a very easy response. Um, you know, we say, "I'm sorry." If you, you know, if you uh, experience bereavement, our natural instinct is to say, God, "I'm sorry." People actually don't want sympathy. Mm. People want empathy. People yeah. want to be understood. Uh, and I think there are those lovely moments 
that we as readers of fiction have, where you will pick up a book and you will encounter a phrase or a situation or a reflection by the writer. And you will think, I have always felt that way. I might never have expressed it in those terms, uh, but it never has struck me to look at it from that angle. But I know that thing to be true. And when that happens, it, it's a really extraordinary moment of contact between two individuals who may be separated by time, by gender, by religion, but a, a moment of commonality where you think actually we're, you're not alone in this, you know, and, and maybe there is a kind of consolation in knowing that. How do you know when your book is actually ready to leave home? Uh, well, somebody even said books are never finished, they're just abandoned. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's a bit like throwing your child on the street and going, there you go. <laughs> there's, there's, there's ninepence, go and get a job. Um, it's, it's uh, For me, I, I come from a journalist background. I'm very practical. Um, I'm not very keen on wandering lonely as a cloud floating on higher veils and hills looking for the muse. I, I sit down and I work every day. Uh, so I set myself a deadline. Um, and I've, I've never not met my deadline. And I've published, I've just delivered my 27th book. Um, because it is, it, all writers need a, a focus. They, you, because you can keep changing things. Um, a book can, I suppose you, it can always be improved, although it can be improved into a kind of sterility at some point. Uh, it can be overworked. Um, and I suppose it's the point that when you're going through it and you're making, you're agonizing over commas and you're making the kind of changes to it that maybe a gnat might be able to spot if it could learn to read. Um, there's a kind of point at, at that stage, it's kind of pointless. But to some degree, you learn by finishing things and you learn by making mistakes and you can start getting afraid of making mistakes. Uh, but actually, we learn very little from success. Uh, you know, apart from the fact that you can choose to simply repeat it over and over again until you drive it into the ground. Your learning experiences are all from failing. Um, and every book is a failure. Because what will happen is you will uh, you will make a set of mistakes in a book. You will think to yourself, well, okay, I don't want to make those mistakes again. Uh, so you will start a new book and you won't make those mistakes. You'll make a completely different set of mistakes. <laughs> and that is the nature of, of human endeavor. All human endeavor is flawed. Uh, and so for me, it's very important to finish things. It is very, and, and you know, I, I don't give writers workshops because I don't know anything about writing. I know how I write books, uh, <laughs> which isn't much use to somebody else, but there you go. Uh, but, you know, the, the two things I do tell people are this, is that uh, every book I've written, I've wanted to abandon after 20,000 words. Every single one of them. Um, and I, I understand that it's a natural part of the process because we begin all new endeavors with a sense of confidence and enthusiasm. Um, and it's a bit like a marriage, actually. You know, you, you enter a marriage with the, with the best hopes in the world or a new relationship. You think it's fantastic. Look at this woman. She is wonderful. I'm never going to tire of her. Uh, we shall gamble through the tulips for the rest of our lives. <laughs> you know, enthusiasm only gets you so far. You know, and then you settle into the hard grind of actually living with somebody, you know, and the ups and downs that come with it. Um, and a book is a bit like that. You embark on a new project with thinking this is going to be wonderful. And it's, it's the idea that you have and it's the fresh idea and you've embarked upon it. And about 20,000 words in, that enthusiasm begins to leach away. And what you're left with is the prospect of, and in some of my books have been very too long. One of them is 170,000 words, which is far too long. But you, you then are left with the prospect of writing another 150,000 words on what? You know, so, and what happens then for a lot of people is that you hear the siren call of the new idea and this little voice in your head that says, you know, that idea wasn't very good. Again, to use the analogy of marriage, that she let you down a bit, you know, and the dolly bird in the bar, and I'll never let you down if you come with me. <laughs> and, you know, and suddenly you follow the dolly bird in the bar and that doesn't work either because, you know, that's why she's a dolly bird in a bar, essentially. Um, but so what happens is if you, what you then, if you're, if you haven't had the experience, I think, of, of writing and finishing something, what you think is, okay, well, that idea wasn't good. This new idea sounds great. Yeah. So I'll put this one away as a, you know, as a, as a kind of Frankenstein's monster experiment that didn't quite work out, unfinished, and I'll stick it in a drawer and I'll do the other thing. And so 20,000 words into the new thing. The exact, and you begin to set a pattern, uh, which is that you leave things unfinished. And when you begin any form of creative life, uh, in fact, we you begin pretty much anything, frankly, but, but it's a good analogy for creativity. You're given a, a finite amount of confidence. And every time you abandon something, you chip a little piece of that confidence away yeah. until finally you have nothing left at all. And you will never write your book or your short story or your poem or do your painting. So you finish everything.
Uh, and that's why.